I'm Pastor Scott. And I'm Hannah. We're so glad that you could join us this morning, whether the church is gathered together or as we are just scattered right now, you are important to us and you are such a critical part of the body. You are what makes us the body and we love you and miss you so much. If you have any comments or questions as you're watching virtually today during the message, you, we would love to hear from you. You can use the comment section or the chat feature. As I said before, we just miss everybody so much and we want you to be reminded yeah. that you are part of our family, that you are a part of Crosspoint. And if you just feel more comfortable staying at home right now, that is totally understandable. And we just, yeah. And, and that's why we want to welcome to church from all of us together. That's right. I hope you enjoy the service and God bless you all. Bye. Bye.
there's nothing worth more that would ever come close no thing can compare your are living home your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord let's welcome him this morning Holy Spirit you are
give you our worship and we receive all your goodness, Lord. Sing name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of our praise, Jesus. My heart will sing how great is our God. Lift your voices this morning. You're the name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Oh, we worship you this morning. Hey, Cross Point, Pastor Dave here, and it's good to be with you today on this Sunday, August 16th. And uh, today, I just want to let you know, I'm going to remind you of this later on, but today is the last day that I'm going to be recording, pre-recording these messages from different locations. Starting next Sunday, August 23rd, we're going to start live streaming again at 10.30 a.m. Not 10 o'clock, 10.30 a.m. We're going to live stream our, live our, our second service from Cross Point Church. And next week you're going to hear from Peter Kruger, who is on our preaching team, and he's going to bring a very unique and personal message to you. We're really looking forward to that. So don't forget, next week the time is changing from 10 o'clock to 10.30. We're going to be live streaming from here on out. Every once in a while, we I might choose to go somewhere um, but we're not going to change the time any, on, on you again. We'll, we'll keep it at 10.30 moving forward. So welcome today to uh, Terra Firma Landscape Company. This is in um, Muskego, Wisconsin, right off of Janesville Road. And Terra Firma is owned by a good friend of ours. Oh, nice. You're giving me a Terra Firma hat yeah, too? Totally. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Well, I just got a gift here from... My good friend Brandon Bunchkowski, he's, he and his wife are members of our church and uh, he owns, along with his brother Brett, they own uh, Terra Firma Landscape and he also, they also own Best Choice Landscape and now I have a hat from both places to add to my collection. Oh yeah, I like that. Alright, so today... I'm really excited about today. We're going to look at Psalm 107, and I want to start by talking about something that's going to be very controversial to some people, um, but it's important for you to hear, I think. Most people have no idea what a day in the life of a police officer is like. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege of serving as a chaplain for the West Dallas Police Department, and some of the things we do, we go to roll call. From time to time we go on ride-alongs at least we used to right now that's um, on hold but we the main service that we provide for the city of West Dallas and for the police department is that we assist with death on site and death notification calls and um, so we're the people who show up at someone's front door unannounced to give them the worst news that they've maybe ever heard and one thing I've observed about police officers is that they are often called to confront or to help people on their worst day when they've hit rock bottom. It's a thankless, difficult, and taxing job, and it's, one, it's a job that most people, myself included, could never do, not, at least not for long. The life expectancy for police officers in the United States is somewhere around 57 and that's 22 years less than the general population. Police officers are confronted with angry, violent, and unpredictable people on a regular basis. They see things on a regular basis that most of us would never choose to see, from abused children to dead bodies to domestic violence. Their jobs are demanding, extremely stressful, and very often traumatic. They are often asked to help people who hate them. One police officer is quoted as saying, no matter how tough you think you are, the contentious calls you get over your career is a slow drip of traumatic events in your life. 
The suicide rate among officers is over four times that of the national average. And this tells us that not just police officers, but many first responders are heading towards their own rock bottom. And this brings us to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 shows us four different kinds of people and they all hit rock bottom. They're all desperate. And when they became desperate, they all did the same thing. And when they did, God did what he does best. And some of you know what rock bottom feels like. And if you do, you never want to go back there. But rock bottom is sometimes where God wants us to be. For some of us, when you look back at your lowest point, you will admit that rock bottom is exactly where you needed to be to discover something about God. And what you discovered is this. God's love never fails. This psalm has one main subject, God's unfailing love. And that's what today is going to be all about starting with Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. So that's verse 1, and the author of the psalm wants us to know right up front what this whole psalm is about. It's about the love of God. And he proceeds to tell us about four unique kinds of people who have encountered this love firsthand and how it radically transformed their direction in life. The first group are wanderers who are desperate for a home. Each group is desperate for something different, and this group of people are desperate for a home, a place to call home, a place to settle, a place where they can be known. And here's what we read in Psalm 107, beginning in verse 4. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. These people were homeless. And when they, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. As a young man, I wandered in life. I wandered from college to college, from city to city, from job to job, from relationship to relationship. And the more I wandered, the more empty I felt, the lonelier I felt. And finally, I reached a, a wall. I reached a place of desperation. I had nothing left to lose, and I cried out to God. And it felt like a cheap repentance. You know, like I didn't have anything to offer God. You know, I, I turned away from Him at every, at every other place. Why would, he, why would He care about me now? But that didn't matter to God. It didn't matter to God that I had nothing to offer Him but myself. It didn't matter to Him that I had nothing left to lose. God was ready and happy to take me and to take my life and turn it around and make me a new creation. And that's the hope that's offered to the wanderers in this psalm. These people are restless, they're hungry and thirsty, but they're never satisfied. They, they, they will, these are people who get excited about something, but then it soon fades away and then they move on to something new. They keep looking for a place to settle, but they can't seem to find it. They can't rest. And eventually they start to decline and it feels to them that their life is slipping away. And think about this, they waited until they were desperate to pray. And that's what we often do. We wait until we've run out of options. We wait until we have no idea what to do next. We wait until we've lost control. And then, we and only then, we cry. do we cry out to God. And what does God do? Does he say, well, you should have called out to me earlier. You shouldn't have waited. You should have asked me when you had the chance. Now it's too late. No, God doesn't shut the door on the desperate. He listens and he hears their cry and then he delivers them from all their trouble. And what this tells us is that it is better to be homeless with a heart that longs for God than to be wealthy with a heart that is self-sufficient and stubborn. You know, the only people in Psalm 107, the only people being rescued are people who know they need it. They're people who know that they're desperate and who know they need to be saved. They're people who know that they're in trouble. They are in distress and they want to be rescued. And as soon as they cry out to God, he answers. He doesn't hesitate. He rescues them and leads them to safety. The second group of people are people who are stuck. And what are they desperate for? They're desperate for freedom. Psalm 107 verse 10 tells us about them. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. 
So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. Now I have a confession to make this morning. I have actually been to prison a few times as a visitor and as a Bible study facilitator. I used to be part of this ministry called um, Amazing Grace Prison Ministries and I think it's still going and I went a few times with them to help out lead Bible studies and um, prisoners you experience a unique kind of distress. They don't make their own schedule, they don't make their own, they don't decide where to go, they ha have really no say in their day-to-day -day routine. They don't ever really even see the light of day for months and sometimes years. At the prisons I've been to, they never go outside, they don't ever see the sky. All they see are walls and doors. There's no windows anywhere and they are not able to open or close any doors. They are completely isolated from the outside world. And we would go into this prison in, in uh, downtown Milwaukee and walk into a big room full of inmates who were out of their cells and we would tell them why we were there. It was a little intimidating to, and invite them to our Bible study, and which was in a room on the second level and it was a small room. It was usually cramped and whoever wanted to come could come and most of the guys in there I think would come because it was just a change of pace. It's something different. But a few guys would come because they were desperate to hear from God. And these were men who had already been redeemed by God. They knew God. They met him in that prison. They were asking questions and taking notes, and they were so happy to see us. And what that tells us is that it would be better for you to be hungry for God's word in prison than to be totally free and have no desire for the word of God. I really believe that. Have you ever seen a prisoner cry? It is the crying prisoner who has hope, not the hardened prisoner, not the bitter one, not the vengeful or angry one. It's the crying prisoner who will experience God because there is no redemption without humility. And prisoners, these prisoners were humbled and they cried out to God and he broke their chains and he set them free. And God can do that in your life today. Let's move on to the third group. These people are sick and desperate for forgiveness. And we begin reading about them in verse 17. Some suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. That tells us that they were physically ill. Then, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. Now these people are clearly sick, but this could be physical or mental illness because we know that people who suffer from mental illness also experience severe loss of appetite. They are, these people are so ill they can't handle life. They are fearful, nervous, anxious, and isolated. And we are told here that their problem is their own sin. Okay, this isn't something that just happened to them. They're not just victims of circumstance. This happened to them. They are physically or mentally ill as a direct result of the sin that's in their hearts. They don't have peace in their life because of the sin in their hearts. And I know what this is like. On March 22nd, 2007, I experienced rock bottom. It wasn't the first time I had hit rock bottom but it was the last time I hit rock bottom. And I mean, it didn't, it was, it was, it was horrible. It, it, and it didn't really happen in a day because I had been making foolish choices and giving into sin for a long time. But in a single day, on that day in particular, everything that I had been doing in secret came to light. I had been hiding who I really was. I had been wearing a mask, not literally. I, it was, I, I had just been hiding and concealing my true identity. And that day my mask came off and my sin was right there out in the open and there I was a full-time pastor exposed as a fraud because of things I had been doing in secret and on that day I knew I, I knew I would lose my job I, I knew my reputation was ruined 
I knew my marriage was ruined and it might even be over. I had literally nowhere to go. I could not go home. I couldn't go to work. I didn't want to be seen by anyone. So do you know where I went on March 22nd? I went to Dave and Ivy Petrick's house, which was in West Dallas at the time. And they weren't even married at the time. It was right before they were married. And my good friend Dave was home. He was one of the first people I called. And he invited me over to his house. And he spent a couple hours with me at the bottom, at my lowest point. And he listened to me. He encouraged me. He prayed for me. He didn't make me feel awkward or guilty, which I was. He didn't make me feel like I had failed him, which I did. He gave me what I didn't deserve, grace. And God used Dave Petrick that day, when no one else was available, to begin redeeming me from what would be the most distressing period of my life. And that distress was brought on by my own foolish choices. And the next day, another Dave, Dave Gustafson, took off work to spend the day with me on the shores of Lake Michigan while I was in distress at rock bottom. No one should be at rock bottom alone. We all need help. We all need someone from God who can lift us out of despair and help us see God's unfailing love. I was a fool. That didn't stop God's unfailing love. I threw my life away. And that didn't stop God's unfailing love. And it took two Daves and a Phil and a Jim and a Don and a Sharon and my wife and eventually a whole church to restore my life and to help me experience God's unfailing love and redemption. And, and we're talking about people who have, they keep sinning over and over again. They keep doing the same foolish things over and over again. They keep hiding. They keep deceiving. They keep, uh, they keep uh, covering up their true identity. Their sin causes them great distress, but they work so hard to cover it up. They've done nothing to earn God's favor or acceptance. They've done nothing but mock God by their actions. And yet as soon as they cry out to him, God delivers them from their distress. He heals them by his word. And they go from mocking God to praising him. And I can tell you that this happens. And I can tell you that it happens. It will happen with anyone who's willing to cry out to God on their worst day. God will answer. God is near to the brokenhearted. He won't turn away from you. And, and finally, we read about a group of people who are threatened and desperate for safety. And they are threatened in particular by troubled waters. And in Psalm uh, 107.25, we begin reading about them. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants. For he spoke, God spoke, and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. Now here we have people who are TCB, taking care of business. They aren't fools. They weren't rebellious. These are just people getting things done. And then out of nowhere, a crisis happens. Can you relate to that? Many of you have experienced something like this in 2020. Some of you started a business in 2020, like our, like our guy Ben Mante at Faklandia Brewing. Our friend Jason Montanos planted a church late last year. That's risky. You know, starting a business is risky. Starting a church is risky, especially now. And if you want to build something great, you will have to take risks. It's part of life. Some of us want to stay safe. We want to stay in the shallow end of the pool where it's safe. But some have chosen to go out into the, the deep where it isn't as safe. And guess where God is? He's in the deep end. That's where these people find God, in the deep waters where it isn't safe. And here's the amazing thing about this whole psalm, really is that God is responsible for their distress. Okay, the, the, the turbulent waters are credited to God. They're attributed to God. That's God's doing. The darkness and gloom that the prisoners faced, that was from God. These people didn't have any sense of their spiritual need until God messed up their life. When their life was going according to plan, they had little, little interest in God. 
they weren't seeking God. They needed God to mess up their life. And so I want to ask you today, has God messed up your life? I pray that he has, and if he hasn't yet, I pray that he will. Because God is sovereign, and he is the one who often brings trouble into our lives to lead us to a place of desperation. God can also, of course, bring peace into our lives and wholeness when there was once brokenness or chaos. This is the God of great reversals. That's what the psalmist wants us to know. He can reverse, he can change the direction of your life at any moment. He can turn anyone's life around for better or for worse. And yet this psalm starts with a daring announcement. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And that begs the question, if God is good, why does he mess up people's lives? Why does he ruin people's lives? Why does he bring danger and darkness into people's lives? And I hope that this has been clear as we've been going throughout the psalm. That the reason God messes up our lives is to humble us. It's to remind us that we are weak and that, and that we are desperately in need of His grace. He does it to, to humble people because when things were going well for them, they were, not in, they were not seeking God. They were doing fine on their own. And so God, to wake them up, He brings trouble into their lives to show them that they are not in control. And those people who are willing to admit they need God and who are willing to cry out to God, they will find mercy. God redeems them. It doesn't matter that they've brought this trouble on themselves. At least two of these groups that we read about in this psalm brought all of this trouble on themselves. They rebelled against God. They rejected his word and his counsel. And God could have said, okay, you don't want me, that's fine. You can live however you want. You can live according to your own laws and your own values and your own word. And I'll just leave you alone. But God isn't willing to leave them alone. He goes after them. He pursues them with darkness and gloom and turbulent storms until they finally come to their wit's end and cry out to God for help. And as soon as they turn to God, He answers. He redeems them and saves them from their distress. He satisfies them with good things. He breaks their chains. He rescues them from darkness. He heals them. He brings them to safety. He gives them joy. He does wonderful things for the most wicked people. People like me. So if you have any success in your life, it isn't because of you. It's because of God. God is good and full of grace. He gives good things to us when we don't deserve it. And he brings chaos and trouble into our lives to get us attention, to, to, to get our attention. He does all of this to show us that he is good and he can be trusted. And most of all, to show us that his love never fails. So the conclusion of the entire psalm is this. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of God. That, that's what we're supposed to do today. We're supposed to consider the great love of God and just how deep it goes. Is God's love deep enough to go all the way down to the bottom of your life, your rock bottom? Absolutely it is. Consider here means to think deeply about and to stare at and to meditate on. And this psalm tells us that when we take time to consider the great love of God, we will change. We will change. So when is the last time you stepped away to a quiet place and simply thought about the depth of God's love for you? When did you last stop to think about just some of the ways that God has showed his great love to you personally? It might have been God bringing trouble into your life to get your attention. It might have been God turning your life around. Maybe it was giving you got a job when you desperately needed one. Maybe God gave you favor with your boss and he gave you a promotion. It may have been God blessing you with money and health and prosperity. It might have been God giving you a spouse or a family. All of that all of those good things come from God. Every good thing every good thing we have comes from God. But maybe it was an illness, or a job loss, or a really bad year for your business that God used to get your attention and to humble you and to show His great love to you. Listen, God is willing to intervene in your life and to turn things around, whether it's for good or bad. 
because he loves you, to get your attention so that you'll cry out to him so that he can redeem you and show you what he's really like. So I want to encourage you today to stop and consider the great love of God because if we don't do this, we might forget about it. And we can't afford to take God's unfailing love to for granted any longer. None of the worldly voices around us are thanking God or praising God for His unfailing love. Those voices come from fear and greed and envy. They are hostile voices that want to divide us and they want us to be afraid. So we need to speak up. The church needs to speak up. We need to talk about the unfailing love of God. We need to tell our stories and to tell people that we haven't always been this way. We used to be in distress. We used to be different kinds of people. We used to be in trouble, but God saved us. He changed us. We need to remember and talk about what He's done for us. We need to remember the song of joy He put in our hearts. And I want, I want to think about today what God has done to show and prove His love for us so that we can praise Him for His unfailing love. Now some of you might actually be at rock bottom today. And I'm not here to make you feel bad about that. But if you are at rock bottom or heading that way, please reach out to us. Please reach out to me. Talk to the person you're with. Because you're not meant to go through this alone. You need a gospel community to experience God's presence and to experience God's redemption in your life. In verse 32, which we didn't read, earlier, but it says, let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. The unfailing love of God should be on our lips. It's something we should talk about regularly, whether we're with people who love God or people who don't. It doesn't matter whether we're with the church in the assembly or not. Wherever we are, we need to remember the unfailing love of God and that we wouldn't be where we are today without it. And my guess is that you're, the reason you're watching today is because you've been redeemed or you're about to be. But if you're someone who feels like, you know, I don't need redemption, I'm not desperate, I've never hit rock bottom, then that's probably the worst position you could be in because you don't realize you need saving yet. So as we close the service today, I want to pray for you and I want to thank God again for His unfailing love. God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your redemption. I thank you for your mercy. And I want to pray for anyone out there today who's watching who is in distress. And I pray, God, that they would cry out to you and that you would hear and answer and that you would show yourself faithful on their behalf, that you would show them your unfailing love and that their life would never be the same. And I also want to pray for those people who are not in distress and who feel as if they don't need to be saved and who don't feel like people who feel like they don't really need you. I pray that they would come to their wit's end if that's what needs to happen, that they would hit rock bottom so that they would see their need for you and so that they can wake up spiritually and so that they will be redeemed by your unfailing love and praise you for everything you've done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank you for joining us again today. And I want to remind you that we are in the process of showing compassion to others right now during this difficult time where there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, we're raising money for a missionary couple that is, um, that is in need of a vehicle. And uh, we're also reaching out to a, a Ephesians Missionary Baptist Church in the city of Milwaukee to help them with, their, um, with a, a wonderful program that they're doing to host up to 100 students a day to help them with their virtual learning in the community of Milwaukee. So those are two ways that you can, things you can give to. Also, we just appreciate your giving, your faithful giving during this time, and that we can be a church that's in, uh, in a state of financial health during this time. So we appreciate that and your generosity. You are helping God's kingdom grow because we are on the move to redeem people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's what we're all about. Everything we do is about that. It's about reaching more and more people with the gospel so that we can make disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus. God is building his kingdom. It's a kingdom that's not of this world. And his kingdom is here and it's growing. And it will outlast every other movement and kingdom that we hear about every day. And so that's the kingdom that I'm most faithful to and loyal to. 
and I hope it's the kingdom you're loyal to as well. And um, so thank you for watching today. Don't forget next week, join us for our live stream at 1030 on Facebook or YouTube, whatever you prefer, 1030. You'll get to see us live and uh, it's going to be good for, for us as a church. I hope it's good for you too. And uh, thank you again for watching, for your support. We love you. We care about you. We're praying for you. And if we haven't seen you in person yet, we miss you. And we look forward to seeing you in person again when you're ready. So God bless you. Have a great week.